Good morning, everyone. I'm Supervisor Hildale Solis of the County of Los Angeles Board of Supervisors representing the first district. And I wanna welcome you all, especially the county employees from the departments of public social services and children and family services. I wanna thank you for joining us today. And I'm very pleased to be here with you in partnership with our brothers and sisters of SEIU 721. So I wanna personally thank you for your continued service and support you are the county's most valuable resource, as I've always said. You are the county of Los Angeles. And I would also like to thank the departments for participating in today's town hall. And I am particularly pleased to be joined by directors Antonia Jimenez and Bobby Cagle. And now I'd like to turn it over to Michael Green of SEIU to say a few words. Thank you. Let me say this is a town hall for social services workers. It is a town hall for emergency responders. And it is a town hall for heroes. If there were any doubts before, there is no doubt anymore. I want to start by saying um, simply that how proud I am of my staff. And you are my heroes. They're the ones who come in day in and day out provide the services that are needed for the most vulnerable population. This has been, without a doubt, one of the most challenging episodes of my career. I think everyone on this call would agree with that. And uh, in doing so, we know that the challenges on your part are greater than ours. And our roles simply are to try to protect you to the best extent possible to give you the uh, information and the uh, protective equipment that you need in order to be able to do your jobs effectively. Many DPSS officers, including all three customer service centers, have still have not made accommodations to allow employees to observe the six foot social distancing guidelines recommended by the CDC and adopted by the Board of Supervisors. These conditions are endangering workers and public health at large. What is your plan to reconfigure the office to maintain six feet social distancing guidelines? And I could say that probably when we first started, um, in some of the call centers, we didn't have the social distancing that I thought was appropriate. And I personally went to uh, some of the call centers to see what that was and how it was working. So. We have expanded telework. We have created ways for customer service centers to be able to work from home. We issued about 400 new laptops to the CSCs um, to expand their capability to work from home so that we can increase our social networking. In addition, we've expanded the telework department-wide by allowing employees to work two days from home. So again, making it feasible and ensure we can maintain our operations um, but also to practice social distancing. So we are expanding our call center hours so that more individuals can continue to work from home, but provide the services that our clients desperately need. And we will be open between eight and five, I'm uh, sorry, eight and eight, Monday through Friday, and nine, nine to five on Saturday. We've reduced the face-to-face -face meetings for large groups of employees and use alternative methods such as virtual meetings like the one we're conducting to conduct our business. And more importantly, we've posted informational flyers on social distancing in common areas in the office, frequent by employees, to remind them of the importance of social distancing. Approval of telework has been inconsistent within offices, leaving employees without adequate guidance on when and how telework would be issued. We know that telework can be extremely beneficial in flattening the curve, helping to maintain the six foot distancing guideline and allowing those over 65 with underlying health conditions to work remotely. Unfortunately, confusion in office has led to uneven policies throughout our department. When can we expect department-wide guidance on telework? Our procedures assign a priority order for teleworking, giving the highest consideration to employees over the age of 65 and those with underlying health conditions. Um, however, the review and evaluation of telework must contain all of our operational needs. As I previously described, we have a high level of new applications coming in. 
We're also an essential services department for the county in the event of an emergency such as this one. The DPSS must continue to ensure the continuity of operations while balancing the needs of the employees. We will always make sure that employees are as safe as possible. And since the rollout of telework in DPSS, over 50% of our employees are participating in full-time or even part-time telework assignments. And this specifically includes individuals over the age of self 65, those individuals who are self quarantined people with underlying health conditions, and those individuals that are impacted by school closures. We understand that all of these impact people's lives, and we want to make sure that we provide them with the opportunity, not only to use sick time, but also to work and telework so that they do not have to maximize uh, the use of their personal time. So that is also important to us. We will continue to expand the telework efforts during this period of emergency and even beyond. And while we'll focus on balancing the needs of the employees, the operation is important. We also need to know that we have a huge responsibility in serving LA County residents. And we depend on our workers, our heroes, our employees to make sure that our customers get the best service that they can possibly. While we understand that DPSS is a frontline responder department, management still has the discretion to improve the FMLA and emergency sick leave requests. Many employees are caring for vulnerable family members or are caring for children who will not be back at school for months. What guidelines are managers receiving to ensure they are not unreasonably denying requests from eligible employees? DPSS did get the guidelines from the Department of Human Resources, I believe it was last week. And we released our guidelines to our departmental managers to make sure we educate them about the federal leave and the process for review and approval. And to ensure consistency on how that is uh, implemented across the department, um, we've assigned the dep our Department of Human Resources <clears throat> in reviewing and evaluating all the FMLA and discretionary leave. We have established a dedicated email box for employees to submit a leave request from home or from work. We've released an announcement to all DPSS employees summarizing the federal leave types, exemption, and procedures for submitting a leave request. We've established a dedicated team of HR professionals to review these leave requests and answer employee questions and obtain the status of their requests. And we're doing this, and our team is ready to do this in a very expeditious manner. And so you'll be hearing from our DR, DH, our human resource group who will be working uh, with individuals who are currently self quarantined or impacted by school closures or unable to work or telework so that we can connect them to one of these very important federal leave programs. There are still not departmental wide policies regarding office cleaning and disinfecting after the worker has tested positive for coronavirus. And many cleaning contractors are not adequately staffed to handle the increased cleaning demands. What assurances can you give employees that offices are being properly cleaned after an employee at that location tests positive? So our DPSS property and emergency management unit coordinates with the internal services department and our leasing company's management uh, uh, staff really to conduct enhanced daily custodial services to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. The enhanced services include the use of methods and chemicals in accordance with the CDC guidelines to focus on cleaning and disinfecting high touch points such as door handles and knobs, light switches, handrails, phones, desks, countertops, front desk and the lobby surfaces and elevator buttons and all closets. So we're doing a comprehensive cleaning of all of our buildings. And when the department receives a report of a positive COVID-19 case, our HR staff works with private management to create the request of a targeted cleaning team for that space. The goal is to ensure that the affected areas are clean prior to staff re-entering into the building or the work area. Once completed, HR staff sees a confirmation that the office has been clean and disinfected after each report of a COVID-19 positive test result. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Antonio, for answering the questions. I would like to take this time now to introduce uh, David Green, who is going to ask the Department of Children, Family, and Services, uh, Bobby Cagle, the questions. 
pertaining to DCFS. Good morning. My name is David Green, Children's Social Worker, DCFS employee for the last 19 years, and also the treasurer for SEIU Local 721. Thanks again to Supervisor Hilda Delise, uh, Chair Barger, the ISD team that put this all together. Much appreciated. I also want to recognize that our LA County workers were frontline responders. We're out there risking ourselves, our families, our health every day to protect the most vulnerable families and children. My, my colleagues, my coworkers in LA County are, are really heroes. Many support staff feel disenfranchised by some of our recent policies during the pandemic. For example, most EWs and DCFS clerical staff and human service aides have not been allowed to telework. What is the plan for supporting these staff and keeping them safe? The maximum social distancing plan that I referred to earlier is the plan for the entire department. But further beyond that, we've required regional administrators and those who operate offices, and I should say that there are in excess of 20 of those offices around the county, um, have actually drafted the same plan specific to their office and their operational needs. And this is necessary because all of our offices don't share the same functions. They share a variety of functions. Uh, and we, what we've tried to make sure that we have been inclusive of all staff in developing those plans, even support staff and HSAs, which I find to be some of the most important staff that we have. For those essential to daily operations, there's a rotation of support staff reporting to on-site. Uh, and other days, those people are allowed to telework. The number of days that a staff person teleworks it's sometimes fluid because it depends on multiple factors, including the number of existing staff that perform the functions that they perform, and also taking into account those who are out sick with COVID-19 or other illnesses, and if possible, any hardships that they have, uh, including child care concerns uh, and also being a part of a vulnerable population, such as being older than 65 or having immune uh, compromised systems. Support staff also, um, if you do not have remote access, uh, you should, but if not, you can submit a ticket through the online portal or ISD through our help desk, and we'll get that established for you if at all possible. Uh, we also have taken other tasks that support staff may do that don't require uh, computers to be able to allow uh, those people to do work from home, including things like updating uh, logs, uh, making sure that we're requesting information by telephone, such as medical, dental, educational reports, or police reports. So we've tried to accommodate um, all employees, and at this point, as I said, we have 70-75% that are daily teleworking, and um, our uh, hope is to be able to continue that uh, in large measure even after this uh, concludes because we're learning so much about the positive opportunities offered here. <clears throat> Many of my colleagues, our DCFS employees, are fearful of an outbreak taking place in their office or not being informed when a coworker is tested positive for the coronavirus. What's the protocol if there is a confirmed a confirmed coronavirus case in the office. What are the communication, cleaning, and quarantine protocols? Upon learning that an employee has tested positive for COVID-19 or is even presumed to be positive, the regional office leadership uh, should be issuing now a standard notification letter to all staff, including co-located staff in the building. And based upon, uh, unfortunately, the, the HIPAA laws that are in place to protect medical privacy, we don't uh, disclose the identity of those um, that were actually affected. However, uh, we do work with our DPH partners to notify those who we identify as having had close contact. Then following that, uh, we send those staff home that uh, may have been exposed uh, in within six feet for more than 10 minutes within 48 hours prior to the individual testing positive or showing symptoms. Uh, we also um, coordinate cleaning and disinfecting of areas and surfaces that employees may have touched, as well as the common areas of buildings, such as the entryways, the elevators, the hallways, and the bathrooms. Um, that standard notification letter also includes instruction for staff who believe that they uh, have been exposed and a resource to help staff with stress related to COVID-19 
uh, including DPH resources. We remain available as an executive team should you have concerns of this type, and we try to respond to those as quickly as possible, knowing that it's important that you have all the information possible. Some of our workers are being ordered to transport children to be tested for the coronavirus and are being told to continue to perform face-to-face -face visits even if a family member is tested positive. This is a huge health and safety concern for our workers. What is the protocol when a family or child is tested positive? Are workers required to transport children to these tests? I think the key here is around personal protective equipment. We have provided uh, that. We also have protocols in place around in-person contacts to add safeguards. I want to uh, really just validate the concerns. I mean, I think anybody that is paying attention to this crisis would have uh, reasonable concerns around how to assure uh, in conduct of their job duties that they're protecting themselves and they're taking care of the kids that we're responsible for. Um, in the event that we have uh, family members who have been exposed, we try to make contact with them in a way that respects the social dis distancing rules that we are all familiar with. We have had uh, opportunity to provide guidance on how to uh, then wash hands, how to use the uh, hand sanitizer that is provided to staff. Um, but also, we're allowing uh, workers now with the supplies that we're getting to carry personal protective equipment to provide to the affected family members for use during those meetings as well. Um, we also have a screening process in place that consists of uh, questions around uh, anyone that's positive for COVID-19, um, if uh, we've had uh, people in the household who've had contact with others who are positive, or if they're exhibiting any kind of symptoms. Based upon the information that we collect through that protocol, uh, we ask our workers to then uh, work with their supervisor to develop a plan of action. In many cases, because of the emergency nature of the work that we do, we do have to continue to make those contacts. And as a part of the work we do with children, Workers will need to transport symptomatic children to test if their caregivers are not willing to do so. So we're trying to engage the caregivers who've already been in contact with them to do the transportation. We will uh, provide them with the PPE that is required. We'll also continue to provide the workers with that personal protective equipment. We also ask that they employ as many protective precautions as practical, such as driving with the windows down, uh, seating children in seats further, uh, farthest away from the driver, and washing hands as frequently as possible. Uh, we should also make arrangements to use county vans wherever possible because that allows uh, the practice of maximum social distancing during transit. The other thing that we have done is arrange for a cleaning contract in the event that a worker uses their own personal vehicle or in the event that we use uh, a van uh, for the department, those vehicles are uh, eligible for cleaning immediately after the transport, um, and that should be taking place. And so I, I know that this is not a perfect answer to the concerns. However, I want you to know that we will continue to look at each and every piece of guidance from our public health partners and try to provide you with those things that you need in order to protect yourself, but also get your jobs done. I just want to thank all our department heads as well as SEIU uh, for partnering with us on this. I think that, you know, this was a brief exercise for us and perhaps there'll be more. Looking forward to hearing from more members on other subject matters. I know that we had, I believe, at the peak about 780 people that were linked in. And I know many others were not able to for whatever reasons or challenges with the internet. But I do want to say thank you for the opportunity. This particular session was recorded, so it will be viewed or put up on SEIU's website so other members can view if they didn't have an opportunity to see what was going on at this time. It'll be made available. And I want to thank SEIU for that. And I want to